I know I am. And we've been on this series. Paul Larson, thank you. Knocked it out of the park last week. <laughs> Grateful to you. Our newest Bible teacher in the pulpit. And then I've got Sand Sandy and Nigel here. Nigel, I, 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 re <laughs> I renamed you Wendell. Between services, I was talking to Ryan Bodweger. I said, you know, yeah, Sandy and Wendell are here. I'm like, what the heck? So you are now Wendell. I got the L right, right? Yeah. Like Elohim, Wendell. No, anyway. Great Bible teacher, so boy, the pressure's on right now. So, But we've been on this series here, and I said it was going to be a summer series, and we've done that with uh, guest speakers and time off, vacation's good, rest is good. And we're thankful for other gifts in the body. And, but I haven't been able to get off this story, and it's one of my favorites. I know we all have favorites in the Bible. And it's the story of Jacob. And I, lo I mean, even when I think about it, when I'm preparing this, as I read my Bible, I just, I do, I get teared up. Because it, the story of Jacob speaks of God's faithfulness. That's it. Jacob is a scoundrel. <laughs> really. We found it out. He's a conniver. He's a con artist. Digging gouging, trying to make his own way. It was prophesied that he would do that, but still, even though it was prophesied, God blesses him in spite of his bad character. And we've seen that. Heel grabber. Steals from his brother the birthright. Esau, his brother, swears, makes an oath, said, I will kill my brother Jacob. So Jacob has to move. Leaves home, goes with his uncle Laban, Laban is an uncle, but he's a cruel taskmaster, and he takes advantage of Jacob. So Jacob serves for the bride of his dreams, but then also serves another seven, ends up marrying both of the daughters. Then between the two of them and their handmaids, they populate the house of Israel. All tribes are representative. And as I was pondering this story, and we'll get to today's segment I thought, we may be on this into October. I just don't know, because I, I read about Jacob, where we started, 25, whatever, chapter 25, somewhere on there. And through the end of the Bible, or at least Genesis, I would say the Bible as well, but Genesis, it's the story of Jacob. Yeah, Joseph is there at the end, but that's, that's his favorite son. I mean, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on Joseph specifically. But understand, the whole story of Genesis from where we started is God's faithfulness to a man, and he changed his name and called him Israel. And so we're going to be on it for a while. But So here he is. He's served Laban, been there about 20 years. Laban tries to steal from him, but even with his crooked plan, God blesses him. In fact, let's read this. It says this. Thus the man Jacob became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. And so he's blessed. Blessed beyond measure, but he's still not a free man. He's a servant to Laban. He says, I need to go home. I need to go home. Get back to where I came from. So he goes, and as he's traveling, doesn't really tell us how many days it takes. You could probably figure it out if you were a smarter Bible teacher than me, but it doesn't really tell us. But they travel, him and his companions, his flocks, his herds as we just read. And it says this in Genesis 32, that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, the flocks, the herds, the camels, into two companies. Say, why is he distressed? Esau, <laughs> okay? He knows, he remembers that vow, I will kill my brother 20 years prior. And I think sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it too fast and we forget that these are human beings who have feelings, Emotions. If you've lived life long enough, <laughs> at least survive your teens, you realize that emotions can get the best of you sometime. Isn't that true? Can we just be honest? But emotions are good and they help us connect with God, connect with others, but they're not the best way to live by. But emotions, you know, we all have them. And so Jacob had emotions. He's, he's afraid. It tells us he's afraid. I will kill my brother. And I think it would be safe to say, and kind of just go on this journey with me, that among other feelings that Jacob had, is I think he had some regret. I mean, think about it. 
scoundrel, prophesied that he'd be the boss, and certainly he was by thievery. But then he goes and been taken advantage of Laban. And so I think he's saying, boy, my life could have been different. How would it, if I wouldn't have stolen the birthright, where would I be? Because remember, his mother's not even mentioned the rest of the story. She passed away in those 20 years. That's what I believe. She never sent to bring him home as she said she would. But I think he is probably saying, you know what? Staying here working for Laban has not been the greatest. Look at this, Genesis 31, it's recorded. We could skim over this quick if we, and miss it, but I want to point it out. He says, there I was. In the day, the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. He was not enjoying his work. He had to get out, as we just saw. So he's probably thinking, man, my life, even though I've got herds and flocks and all this stuff, my, my family's a mess when we saw that taking advantage of one another, one, one wife trying to please him more than the other one, trying to gain his favor. They get in that competition to have babies. We looked at that a few weeks ago. But he's heading back, and the thing that's interesting, Esau's not looking for his father. I mean, that might be in his mind somewhere, but he's not looking for his father. He's not looking for a place for his family to dwell. He's concerned about Esau, rightly so. That's what's on his mind is Esau. What I did to him all those years before. Genesis 32, it says, Jacob sent messengers before him, Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. And most Bible scholars, I think, would agree, and I think it's probably true, is you could almost, this could be worded like this. Bear with me. Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. Remember, he was the heel grabber. Yes, certainly it was prophesied, but he stole the birthright. And then his older brother would serve him. But now he's saying, say to Esau, my Lord, his servant Jacob is here. His attitude's kind of shifted. I think all those, all those days and those nights Wondering how different could my life have been if I just if I would have just said I was sorry 30 years ago. If I wouldn't have given up so much for one moment of pleasure 10 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever it is, where would my life be? And, and, and I think here's what we do, even as Christians, sometimes I think we're the best at keeping secrets and hiding. We don't talk about it. We pretend everything's okay. Stay with me. But I'm telling you, we get up in the morning and look in the mirror and we let ourselves have it. Every mishap, every decision. And it'll eat our souls. It really will. Regret. Disappointment. And so what I think he's doing is he's trying to repair this burnt-out bridge, this 20-year-old burnt-out bridge. Reconstruction is necessary, and he starts by saying, tell my Lord Esau that his servant Jacob is here to see him. And then he says this in verse 5, and I have oxen and donkey and flocks and male and female servants, and I have, been, I, have been sent, I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. And so again, as you read it, Esau is not flaunting his riches. I believe what he's saying, or Jacob rather, not flaunting his riches, but what he's saying to Esau is, I have the wherewithal to pay you back. I will pay you back for the wrong that I've caused you. Trying to undo the damage that had been done some 20 years prior. Then the messengers that he sends to his brother Esau come back and they give him this report. They said the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. Other places in the Bible, parts of scripture, 400 men is the typical size of a militia or a raiding party and there's no reason to believe otherwise. 
We find out as we read on that's not the case. Esau had forgiven his brother, who knows when, but sometime already in those 20 years. But Esau, because he know, or Jacob rather, because he knows how he treated his brother, he's thinking he's coming with 400 men. He's coming to do business. It's done. He, he said, I'll kill my brother. And he's got 400 of his warriors with him. Of course, verse 7, as you can well imagine, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he's divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. So what does he do? He splits up all of his belongings and household into two companies. That way, if Esau attacks one, then maybe the other can get away or vice versa. I'm going to at least, at least get out of this with half of my spoils. So it's Jacob again, conniving his way, figuring out how to stay ahead of the game. But I think one of the other things we have to imagine, if you will, is Jacob probably thinking, this is it. It's going to end here. I'm at least going to lose half. My brother's mad at me. My life has been miserable and pointless. And I think it's a good chance to believe that Jacob was dealing with something we'll just call unconfessed guilt. Guilt bottled up inside, as we mentioned. Well, we, we don't tell too many people. Perhaps you're one of those people that has figured out the wisdom of having a close friend or two that you can be real with. A person will put their arm around and you say, you know what? There, by the grace of God, go I with you. With you. And what I think is Christianity has turned itself into is these rules and regulations of perfection. Cross the T's, dot the I's, and God will answer our prayers. If you believe it, you'll receive it. Now understand something. The scripture is clear. Jesus said, pray with faith, and whatever you pray, you'll have. I, I don't, I don't dis discount any of that. But what we've turned into is a bunch of people that, hand, that, that hide behind a camouflage of unconfessed guilt. Decisions. Say, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. But inside, and when we look in that mirror, it's quite a different story. Say, well, Pastor, you've talked about this quite a bit. That's why I like Jacob. Because these are the things that if we don't allow God in to help us, our lives... You may even attain some things. I've seen people, looks like they're on top of the world. And, and, and I've heard people say, hey, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. Now, I'm not saying having a few things is bad, but if you don't deal with this, riches cannot heal the grief-filled heart. Only God can do that. No thing, no amount of accolades, positions can achieve that. And I think that's why the Bible tells us, confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Verse 9, 1 John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Walk in the light as he in the light, verse 7. I mean, it's that whole passage there. And this is the key to community. Now, here's what I believe. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. If that wasn't true, none of us could be forgiven our sins because we live 2,000 years, roughly, after Jesus. So he has to forgive sins that have yet to be committed. Does that make sense? And the Bible says that I make you a new creation, one that's never been. As far as the east is from the west, I removed your sin. Don't ever forget that. Your righteousness did not gain it. Your righteousness cannot keep it. Again, it's okay to cross your T's and dot your I's. But you know what I found out? That if I cross my I's and dot my T's, God still is faithful to me. Because I believe. I believe. I mean, me, just like you, I've allowed him to work on the inside, but I'm still a scoundrel. And somehow he answers my prayers. So much so that I know the prayers I haven't seen answered will be answered. 
They will be. Whether now or in the life to come. And I, I don't use that as an excuse. I believe it for things now. Somebody say now. now. But understand something. God is going to move because of his faithfulness. That's what he's always done. The promises of God are yes in him. And amen in him. Not crossing T's and dotting I's. And some of that's important. I hope you're, I hope you're hearing my point today. And God wants us to come confess our sin to him. I mean, he knows. He's already forgiven you. But when we confess and then we get a brother or a sister with us, healing starts to take place. There's some things you cannot do on your own. And there's some things we can pray for ourselves, and certainly we should. But when it comes to these things that when we wake up in the middle of the night, they taunt us. When we look in the mirror, we think, oh, my gosh. If you ever look in the mirror, any, listen, I'm trying to have fun with you. Anyone past 50, you know you look in the mirror and it's like you remember when those bags started. Come on, that's like, And you're like, forget it. They ain't go, I don't care how much sleep I get, they're still there. What happened? And, and say, what are those lines in your face, Pastor Tony? Those are smile lines. Because I make myself smile. Because I'm kind of a serious person, sort of. I mean, I, I get, I'm funny. I got, I got a sense of humor that you'll be like, he is a person in there. If you get around me, you know. But somewhere that person <laughs> still exists. But, but I remind myself I should smile in life because we only get 70, 80 years. Hey, I'm bleeding for 120, but I'll take 80. I'll take 90. 70 is not enough because I'm 64. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. 70 is not enough. But the truth is, even though God says, I remember your sin no more, we need to hear somebody else say, I got you, bro. I got you, sister. I got you. I got you. Your, your, your confession is safe with me. And if you don't have that person, start in our, you know, let us, someone who prays at the end of service, they're very confidential. We carefully pick people to pray, and they're not going to run around and tell people your business. That's a good place to start. Go to that retreat I mentioned. Meet a couple more people. Someone may say, hey, can we take a walk? Say, let's do it. And just start, you know, start to work it, get friendships. Just join a small group. Get involved in ministry. I mean, just getting involved in ministry, you get to know people. I mean, and, and, you know, we're, I'm primarily pulpit gift, and then I'm on the music team. But you get on the music team, and we got these little boxes we push on, and we talk to each other, and maybe you see us sometime. We can push on that, and we go... Then once in a while we push it wrong. And so during rehearsal, you'll hear, oh my goodness. You start to find out these are some real people. Living real life, like getting real up in here now with a real God who's got the answer. Because you know what? Your real life is hidden in Christ. And aren't you glad it's hidden? The Bible says you are sealed. What the Holy Spirit have promised. At the time of redemption, you're sealed. No one can take it. No one can take it. But we're co-forgivers with Christ. Jesus called us to be ministers of reconciliation. It's part of the ministry that every believer is called into. Genesis 32, deliver me, I pray. Jacob needs God's help. From the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me. And the mother with the children, for you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And so we see Jacob praying a prayer. God appeared to him in a dream. But this is the first time that I see that we really see there, there's a maybe second time because he asked God to help him out with Laban. But he's praying this prayer, and I started thinking, you know what? There's only a couple of recorded prayers of Jacob at this point in our story. But isn't, aren't prayers kind of like signposts in life? I mean, maybe you and your family, maybe you pray over every meal together, do the same in a restaurant. So whether it's something like that that can kind of become familiar, those are some signposts, regular prayer. But then you've got prayer where you were just so mad all you could do was scream. I've often said this, and I believe it. 
If you're going to get mad, get mad at God. He can handle it. But don't stay mad. Because if not, you're just going to get mad at everybody else because you've got that suppressed anger. Am I speaking to anybody? One little thing doesn't go right and you're flying off the handle. Ready to pop your top. Why don't you just let God know how much you hurt and how pissed off you are. Oh, my. Look, if you're looking for the perfect pastor, you got the wrong church. But I am not him. But, you know, sometimes in life I'm like, what in the world is that? And counted on this. But you know what? When I, I go to God in those times of grief, those signposts of prayer, one thing I always remember were the times he was faithful. One thing I know that even when adult children walk away from the Lord, maybe just a song, God will come and say, I had it before. I've still got it. And I just had to say, even though I don't see it, I know that God, not because of my perfection, not because my family's perfect and has it figured out, but God is faithful. But God. There you go, right there. That's my story, the dots. But God was faithful. And we see that in the life of Jacob, and it's so true. But the Bible teaches us a lot about prayer, really. It's full of prayers, Psalms in particular, but many other places. But Jesus tells a story, a true story. Two men that prayed and how different their prayers were. I want to read this, Luke 18. It says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector, I fast. I am, I fast, I give tithes of all that I possess. Do you see all these eyes? Don't pray like this guy. God is not going to bless you because you crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's. Now, cross the T's, dot the I's. There's nothing wrong, but understand something. I think I've seen it. Just believe me, I've seen it. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one that sees it. Christians who walk with God for a while, they get a... They get a little ambitious, or maybe they're very gifted. Listen, you can be am ambitious and gifted without God. He gives all gifts. Whether we come back to him and serve him, that's, that's for up to us to decide. But then we think, you know, because this person's a good communicator, if I learn to pray just like them, come on, you know I'm preaching good. If I pray just like that guy on TV, well, there's a lot to learn there. Don't, don't pray just like that guy. Pray like you. But get some word in you. We'll, we'll touch on that in a minute because when we pray, we're echoing God's word back to him. But listen, you don't have to perfect this prayer that sounds just like the TV evangelist. Come on, I know I'm preaching good in this house today. And that's what I see in the body of Christ and we're a bunch of camouflage people just trying to pretend we got something figured out. Listen, you can't figure God out. But one thing, he is faithful. And it goes on and says, he says, I thank you, I'm not like this tax collector, but then him standing afar off the tax collector would not so much as raise his eyes at heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said this one was justified. This one, not the I am guy, and I do. And there's, some, there's things that get right in prayer. You know that. We teach on it. But man, I don't care how many prayers you get answered. Don't you ever forget, it's not about you. It's, you can mess up a prayer, and I've seen God move. We're going to see it in Jacob's life. We've already seen it, really. The guy connives, he does things, and God blesses him anyway. Why? Because God is faithful. That's, that's, that's what Jacob teaches me above all. God's faithfulness. So many other types of prayer in the Bible. Abraham bargains with God. Maybe, maybe you've read that. One time Abraham lies and God blesses him anyway. I, I can't figure some of this stuff out. But I don't try to figure it out. I just say, God, you're good. You are so good. How could I not serve you and want to please you? And to me, that's the key right there. To maturing and being healthy on the inside. Solomon is Solomon delivers his eloquent 32, 33-page, or word, rather, 
prayer. It's like, man, if I could just pray like Solomon. Hey, Solomon knew how to pray, but he messed his life up, y'all, in the end. That's all I got to say. Somebody say, but God. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Blind Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus. In Greek, it's only five words. Help! And Jesus says, you're healed. What? Well, that's because Jesus was there. Look, the Bible says that we'll do greater things. The only time, the only reason things even happen is because God's good. Say, God's good. And that's what we see. We're echoing God's promises back. You're good. You're faithful. Your promises are yes and amen. And David teaches us exactly what I'm talking about, echoing God's word back to him. Second Samuel, it says, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning your house, establish it forever and do as you have said. Don't do according to my works. Don't do according to, oh, well, you know, I paid my tithes, God. Paid my tithes. I even served in the nursery. I even ran the soundboard. And because I'm real gifted, I run the soundboard and I serve in the nursery and I pay my $88.16 tithe. Come on, y'all. <laughs> oh, my. Well, pay your tithes, but keep the 16 cents. <laughs> some, of you, some of you all got to lighten up in here. Oh, my. God says in Isaiah 43, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Come on, he says, remind me of how good I am. Speaking of Israel, but the precept is for all of our prayers. He says, I've set a, wa a watchman on your walls of Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And give him no rest until what? He has stabbed. Give, give him no rest. What? Pray. Don't stop. Don't stop. Just keep coming. Keep asking. Ask. Seek. Pray. Ask. Seek. Pray. Ask. Seek. Pray. So we already found out Jacob's greatly afraid of Esau. Verse 9 in chapter 32, it says, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who has said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all these mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, but now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you have said, I will surely treat you well. You have said, I shall surely treat you well. We're going to talk about that in a minute because God didn't say that. Jacob added this. <laughs> and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which I which cannot be numbered for multitude. In the beginning of his prayer, it also sounds good, and I, I believe he, he's exalting God. He's thanking God for his mercy, his faithfulness. That's all good. But then he squeezes in that little thing, I, surely treat me well. Surely treat me well. And you know, God, I left home. All I had was my staff. But now I've got all this stuff. It's almost like he's saying, well, God, when I left home, all I had was a dollar to my name, but now I have two bank accounts. Wow, look at me. Do you remember where I started? And yeah, you're faithful, but don't forget. Just remind God of his, his word. You don't have to remind God of your faithfulness. <laughs> he knows if you're faithful or not. He says, remind me of my faithfulness. But here's the thing. <laughs> and this is, this is what gets me in the, in, in the life of Jacob and so many other stories in the Old Testament. Even though I think he's kind of twisting in his Jacob way, God still answers his prayer. <laughs> not only does Esau not kill him, they rejoice together. Esau's already forgiven him. God is already taking care of it even before Jacob asked. Oh, come on, somebody. Jesus said, even before you ask, your heavenly father knows what you want. He already knows it. He already knows. 
Verse 4 and 33, it says, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. See, the scoundrel, again, doesn't get what he deserves. He never has. That's why I like this story. I think trying to bargain with God, trying to, trying to twist and say, well, you know, God, you said all this. But the truth is, read this with me. This is really what God said. 28, 15, behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. In 31, he says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and your family, and I will be with you. What God said is, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you. God didn't say, I'm going to give you all kinds of material wealth. That is not what God said. All that stuff, yeah, God blessed him. But that was just Jacob being Jacob. But God reminds him that he would never leave him. And you know, it's so true. I will never leave you. Hebrews chapter 13, it says, be satisfied with the things that you have so you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. And so the scoundrel again gets blessed, even though he's trying to connive God into something to bless him because he's so magnificent at being Jacob, I guess. He blesses him. And you know what the truth is? I'm that scoundrel. So are you. I remember I prayed once. I was with somebody, and I said, Lord, I pray that I get a parking spot right up front. We pray that all the time. And they said, that's a selfish prayer. And I thought, aren't they all? Unless you're praying for somebody else. Come on. Have a little fun with me. Selfish. Well, yeah, I'm selfish. <laughs> what, man, you know, I want a parking spot. <laughs> And I'll drive around until I get that park. So I know I'm just, and God still gets it for me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Ephesians 3, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do you see that? He does more. Somebody say more. You don't get God figured out and then he answers your prayer. He always does more. Just don't stop believing. Just like that old classic rock and roll song. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. Okay. No, feelings. Street. Your minds are in the gutter. Immediately you go on a journey. When I, okay. You bunch of scoundrels. All of you. Scoundrels. Scoundrels. But I want to say, can we just be honest about something? Let's face it, we do not know how to pray most of the time. I mean, again, we should try. We should certainly quote God's word back to him. I, I've already established that. But you don't know what to pray. Romans 8, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For when we do not know what to pray the way we should, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Luke 11, Jesus says, you being of this world, give good gifts to your children. Doesn't your heavenly father do even more so? Then he says, when you ask your heavenly father for a fish, he doesn't give you a serpent. But you know what? I think we ask for a serpent and he gives us a fish anyway. <laughs> Why? Because he's good. He's so good. I mean, I think Christians could be so much healthier if they would just realize. Not even one comes close. Not even one compares to you. Gratefulness. Thankfulness. Reminding him of his faithfulness. Romans 8, it says, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Whew. Paul is saying, look, he already took care of your future eternally. Do you think he's going to leave you out in the rain? I mean, think about it this way. An earthly father, if I give my children, they're all saying, what are you going to give me? Your inheritance. If I can just get your mother to stop spending it. 
But, um, it, no, just, just not. <laughs> keep them guessing. That way they don't, they get, no, I'm expect too much now. No. But uh, if, if I say, I'm going to give you $20 million, there's a $20 million house. Do you think I wouldn't buy him a cup of coffee? Or if I donate my kidney to help someone who needs it, do you think if they trip, I won't help them get up off the ground? That's what Paul's saying. If God purchased freedom, eternal freedom for you and I, won't he, through Jesus, buy you a cup of coffee? Don't ever forget how good he is. And I'll leave you with this. I'm amazed, you know, kids can go out and grab a stick, maybe take a stone or something a little sharp and put a little line in it and bring it to their mother. And I made this for you. And she's like, oh! I'm looking at it, it's a stick. <laughs> Maybe that's why they never brought me those sticks, but <laughs> Trish got them. But, <laughs> but you know what? Our prayers are like that stick. If we're, if we're letting God clean our hearts, are you with me? If it's a pure, I mean, you know, study the word, remind God of his word. I'm not saying, but guard your heart. Keep it with all diligence because the flowing of the life flows out of your heart. The, the abundance of the things. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's the thing that comes out. But I think our prayers, it's like we come and we offer God a mud pie. And he's like, oh, that's a decadent dessert. Why? Because that's my child. They came to me in faith and reminded me not of their good works. They even misquoted a scripture a little bit. Come on, come on. That's dessert. And he'll bless you in spite of your faults. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, help us to never, ever underestimate your goodness. Help us never, ever figure you out. To always be in awe. Just like that little child that brings that stick to his mother. We bring our mud pie because we know you're delighted in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.